Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Attorney General Mark Burnovich joins us in studio. And we'll learn about a new effort to combine care for the elderly with educational opportunities. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich is in his first year as the state's chief legal officer. Same-sex adoptions, a controversial West Valley tribal casino, and a whistleblower complaint against APS and the Corporation Commission are among the issues facing the AG's office. Joining us now is Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich. Good to see you again. Great seeing you, Ted. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, before we get into it, how's the transition going? Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, I've been very fortunate and blessed. I've been given this public trust, and I'm a big believer that personnel is policy, and so we've brought in a lot of really experienced folks with various backgrounds, diverse backgrounds, and we're hitting the ground running. A lot of the old regime's still there, a lot of the old regime kind of on different places. Well, you know, I, I think that a lot of folks have moved on. You know, I, I thought it was important to have a fresh start in the Attorney General's office. One of the things that I used to talk a lot about when I was running is that the Attorney General is you're held to a higher standard because you know you're representing the people of Arizona and I've had meetings with all of our individual divisions and I keep emphasizing we're not all state we're not state farm we are the state of Arizona we should take pride in that when we go into court and we represent folks and um, and so I just want to make sure that that uh, gets down to all the folks that are in our office all right uh, let's get to some issues here starting with gay adoptions what exactly did you tell uh, Child Protective Services and, and uh, or whatever they're calling it these days. The letters, it gets so confused. But what did you tell them regarding legally married same-sex couples and fostering and adopting? Well, you know, Ted, one of the things that um, when, you're the pe when you're the Attorney General for various state agencies, um, I'm limited as to what I can specifically say because of attorney-client privilege. But let me just talk broadly about this issue. Um, we do know that the Ninth Circuit had ruled that same-sex marriages were legal in, here in the Ninth Circuit. Um, we also know that the Supreme Court had accepted certiorari that they were going to hear uh, cases were involving gay marriage. In fact, just this week there was arguments on those cases. And I think the most prudent course of action is where we have Arizona statutes like for dealing with adoption that contain language such as man and woman or there's certain preferences for when, when it comes to um, a husband and wife when they adopt jointly. And so those statutes um, don't necessarily provide a preference for someone who's quote unquote married, but they use terms like man and woman, husband and wife. And so I thought the best thing to do is let's wait till the U.S. Supreme Court decides this issue, gives us some guidance, um, you know, because we've heard everything from, well, is there an equal protection claim here? Um, are they going to use strict scrutiny when it comes to, um, you know, these types of cases? And so we don't know what's going to happen. And so I think we should wait. But some would say that waiting, and some did say that waiting was discriminatory against certain married couples. It's not, Ted, because anybody, even a gay person, can adopt someone right now. When the statute set forth various preferences, there's you know preferences for, for example, um, you know a husband and wife over a single person. And so the question becomes, well, how do you interpret when a statute uses plain language such as husband and wife or man and woman? How do you interpret that in light of what's going on in the same-sex marriage debate? And I think the most prudent action is the attorney general. And I ran on this. We talked about this. Is that. And we tell our lawyers, we're always going to go back to, what does the statute say? What does the statute say? And we know the Supreme Court is hearing arguments on this case, and it should provide us some guidance as to how we should look and interpret those statutes moving forward. So those who would say, though, that denying those adoptions would lead to a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, you say... I would say that there's language in our state statutes that talk about adoption preferences and people adopting jo jointly, and they refer to a man and woman and a husband and wife. And right now we know the U.S. Supreme Court is hearing arguments on this issue, and they will, I think, give us some guidance as to how we should interpret those. Because you mentioned equal protection. That's one of the arguments being made. But, you know, there's other folks that say, look, in less than a decade ago, Arizona voters approved a constitutional amendment that defines marriage, for example, as a man and woman. Um, we also know that there's been, you know, talk of maybe someone like a Justice Kennedy saying, well, this is up to the individual states to decide. And maybe under the Constitution, states would have to recognize same-sex marriages under the full faith and credit clause. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they would have to allow them in this state, which, of course, then I think would create some issues and confusions as to how do you yes. do those preferences then? What does that mean? Yeah, that compromise recognized kind of situation, I think, has a lot of folks worried that the court might go that way, although it, I'm not quite sure it will. But uh, the governor said basically to 
heck with prudence. Uh, we want these kids adopted. We want them in families. Um, and pretty much overturned your advice. Your, your thoughts on that? You know, I when I ran, and I have consistently maintained, and we consistently tell our lawyers, I am not a policymaker. Um, we do, what does the law say? You know, when Attorney General Corbin um, was in office, he just always talk about, well, what does the law say? We always go back to the law. I can make recommendations without getting any specific attorney-client issues. I can make those recommendations, but ultimately, I'm not a policymaker. Do you agree with the governor's decision? As I said, I think the most prudent course of action in this instance, with a case pending before the United States Supreme Court on this important issue, I think the most prudent course of action is to wait until the Supreme Court makes its decision, and then that'll provide us some guidance and some instruction on how we should interpret the statutes and whether a statutory fix is necessary or not necessary. Okay, so not necessarily agreeing with the governor on this one. Um, I think I said what no. I said. Okay. <laughs> do you have a good working relationship with the governor? I, I, I do have a great relationship with the governor. Um, in fact, we just had lunch last week, and um, you know, I, I like to say that uh, if someone agrees with you eight out of ten times, I think they're your friend, um, and if someone agrees with you ten out of ten times, they're probably your psychiatrist because no one agrees with everyone all the time. But we have a we have a we have a very good relationship, and you know, Kirk Adams is his chief of staff, and I've known Kirk for a while, and. Um, so I think we have a very, very good relationship. I, I asked because uh, during the legislative session, the governor wanted, at the last minute it seemed like, a new state inspector general. We're talking a badge, police power, subpoena authority, the whole nine yards. You said that was unnecessary. Explain. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the question is, is this, does Arizona want or need um, some law enforcement authority subpoena powers that can investigate fraud, fraud, excuse me, fraud and corruption? Well, the answer is yes, and we have somebody. It's the attorney general, and every four years, Arizonans, um, you know, make a decision whether they agree with what that person is doing or what they're not doing. And so, I, I maybe I'm a little old school on this stuff, Ted, but I believe that government shouldn't be in the business of trying to find solutions to problems. Excuse me, pr uh, or finding problems to solutions, or you know, excuse me, solutions to problems that may or may not exist. There you go. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're getting at, but yeah, I really you know, so, so I, I think at the end of the day, we're doing that. I mean, that's not to say that I mean, you know, we have an auditor general in the state, and I, I mean, I chaired Governor Brewer's Pro Commission on Privatization and Efficiency. Nobody wants to protect hardworking taxpayers more than I do. I understand that. I just don't think having an inspector general, at least the way the legislation was written, is the right approach or the right model. Yeah, the governor says that Arizona needs someone to ask the tough questions and someone that Arizona needs someone to watch out for the taxpayer. Um, and he thinks that that is necessary regardless of the AG's position or the AG's office. How do you well, respond to well, that? Well, you know, as you know, Ted, Arizona's different than, than many, if not most, states. And other states, um, you know, in Arizona, the agency directors, for example, are not merit protected. So if the governor is concerned about what an agency director is or isn't doing, he has the ability to call up that person and say, hey, why are you spending money this way? Why are you doing that? When they do the budget appropriation, the governor's office is very involved in that. And so I, I'm all for oversight, and that's why we have an auditor general. When it comes to um, you know, fraud and you know, corruption, we have an attorney general that has subpoena power, police powers to investigate those matters, which we, we've done. Even before I inherited that office, other attorney generals have done. So. Um, you know, I, I think there's always, um, to me at least, at least on my part, there's always a reluctance to uh, increase the size and scope of government, especially when it comes to something, somebody that has subpoena powers or law enforcement functions. Um, so I, I just, you know, I felt, I felt like this is something that our office is doing and between us and the Auditor General. And if you're worried about, um, you know, protecting the taxpayers, I think there's other ways to do that. Last point on this, are those who, uh, the governor kind of is included in this camp, but there are those who say that there are businesses that are doing business with the state that are taking advantage of the taxpayers and they, it, we just need to step up on this. Is the Attorney General's office ready to step up on this? Well, you know what, you we our office is very, very zealously gone after you know consumer scams. We've gone, we're protecting consumer consumers. Excuse me, since even the brief time that I've been in office, you've seen some of the things that we've done with whether it's settlement with rooftop solar companies, whether it's going after you know bad mechanics. Um, we are willing to go out there and inv and if investigate if necessary, either through civil procedures or through criminal procedures get to the bottom of people that are taking advantage of the hardworking taxpayers. So I would say, well, show us where that's at or what's going on, and we'll get to the bottom of it. And you can do that without an inspector general getting in the way. That would be um, my proposal, yes. All right. Uh, the probe, the investigation of APS, this is a whistleblower complaint regarding APS and the Corporation Commission. Obviously, you said you were not, you were going to recuse yourself uh, regarding this case, but you allowed your staff to continue investigating. Why? You know, 
what we what we know that um, historically as someone that's been a prosecutor, I have never asked someone when I've prosecuted a case what their background is, what their political affiliation is, whether they're conservative or Democrat, Republican, independent, because it's really irrelevant. Um, the only reason why in this instance I thought it was a, maybe a, a good idea to take myself back and, uh, and wall myself all wall myself out from that is because there had been some articles written about it and I wanted to avoid that appearance of impropriety. But at the end of the day as a prosecutor, very often you might be investigating, especially in a place like Arizona and Phoenix, you know, in some ways this is a, a, a big city but a small town. There's always some interconnectedness between folks and um, you know people know each other. But that doesn't mean that you can't be fair and objective and impartial. It always comes down to what the statutes say. We're going to follow the law and obey the law. And if voters don't think I'm doing that, they can vote you out of office. Uh, but I thought it was important to wall myself off. And I, I brought in you know, Don Conrad, the head of our criminal division, um, who actually worked with uh, Terry Goddard, and John Lopez, who um, was at the US Attorney's Office for years. And um, he's my Solicitor General. And what I did is I delegated the authority into that investigation to them. I walled myself off, so I'm not involved in it. it but if it has even the appearance, and we should mention an APS donated 400 some odd thousand dollars to uh, the Republican Attorney General's Association, which launched uh, ads against your opponent during the campaign, and that's I'm guessing that's why you're recusing yourself from this. But it, why not just send this out to another agency because, and get that whole you know, appearance over with? Because, Ted, first of all, none of that money ever went to me or my campaign. And um, so there, there really isn't an ethical conflict. If you look at the ethical rules with prosecutors, there isn't an ethical conflict. And what we did, what we did, only out of an abundance of caution. I think it's very, very dangerous as a prosecutor. People can literally start creating conflicts um, by trying to, um, you know, maybe open an investigation or donate a campaign. So let's just say, even with some of the stuff that you, we see that's going on with, with the sheriff in federal court now, there's issues about, well, if someone investigated someone, does that create a conflict yes. and you could have end up having these self-fulfilling prophecies or situations where people could do things that would force you by that logic to recuse yourself from cases when you are the best person and the best office situated to do it. At the end of the day, Ted, our office is charged. This is what we do. We investigate, you know, corruption. We investigate these violations and we are the best capable, we have the best resources, we have the best talent to do it. So why would we want somebody else to do that? But do you understand why some see this as questionable? Frankly, I don't think it's questionable because at the end of the day, I've walled myself off from being involved in it out of an abundance of caution. But even there, I think if you talk to anybody that's a that's, a, that's an ethics expert or someone that's involved in this, there is nothing or in the black letter law that would prohibit us from moving forward on that. I did it out of an abundance of caution and you know, frankly, I don't, I, there's so many things going on in this state right now, Ted, that it's, to me, that's water under the bridge right now and it's, it's really, you know, what we've got, things going on with, you know, the casinos and um, things going on with immigration and, and there's so many other more important issues facing the state. Well, Let's not get in the weeds on that. Okay, well, I, I kind of like the weeds sometimes. So, but, uh, we, we can, we can are we going to talk on. about marijuana we can, now? Uh, no, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are not. But we are, I do want to mention the casino uh, because just today now we had the uh, Senate subcommittee deciding that they wanted to go ahead uh, and try and stop this thing. Your efforts on, uh, your thoughts I should say, on efforts to stop a travel casino near Glendale. As you know, Ted, I was the former Arizona Department of Gaming Director and as a federal prosecutor I worked a lot in Indian Country and on gaming related matters. I understand this issue very, very, very well. And in 2002, Arizona voters were promised that gaming, the gambling, was going to be limited and well regulated. And what the Tone Altham Nation has done by buying land more than 100 miles from their tribal capital, um, they've, they're basically blowing up the tribal compacts. And so we, once again, were asked to question our office to provide legal advice to an agency, agency, which we do. At the end of the day, this is a policy decision for the governor and the Arizona Department of Gaming, how we want to proceed. But I believe they have a legally defensible position and I think it's an important position because we know that the Tone Oath Nation had made promises regarding you know they weren't going to build any casinos here and then they secretly bought land with a dummy corporation and um, they you know basically tricked the voters in 2002 as to their real intentions. And yet they are winning at every turn when they hit the courts. I mean the, the federal courts are they're basically saying that the compact doesn't specifically doesn't specifically prohibit new casinos. And, 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 and you are partly right they, they have won but there is a case right now now with that very issue that's pending before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and so you know we should hear back as to as whether they won that or not but at the end of the day let's remember if you go back in time the federal government flooded damaged tribal land in the 1950s 
You know, in the 1980s, they gave them money to buy land even before the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was passed. And this, what we're talking about here is Indian country. Once this land's taken into trust, it's like the land of a sovereign nation. So it creates all sorts of issues, even for law enforcement. There's a high school right across the street there. What happens if there's an emergency? What fire department's going to respond? What if someone's arrested? I mean, you know, so, so there's all sorts of issues that I think that when it comes to public safety, you know, besides the basic issue about how they went about getting this, but when you have a tribe building a casino 100 miles from you know their existing tribal lands, I think it creates all sorts of problems. Do you think they engaged in fraud? I think that they definitely made misrepresentations, and if you look at what they did, promises were made in 2002 when that compact was um, put before the voters. Promises they made not only to the people of Arizona, but promises they made to their fellow tribal members. And I think that's one of the reasons why this, their sister tribes, tribes like Salt River, um, also Gila River, um, are involved in litigation as well, because they feel like they've been betrayed by the sister tribe. So you think that, uh, last question on this, we got, I gotta let you go after this, but you think that government gives them the money, they use the money to buy the land, the land is now tribal land, they can't do what they want to do with it. Arizona voters were told, told that there was not going to be any more uh, casinos here in the, in, the, in the urban area other than what was there at the time, and Tone Altham basically has blown it up. And I think the big question is going to become, Ted, that people are going to start asking, and tribes, and Tone Altham still doesn't answer this question, they own other patches of land in, in, in here in Maricopa County and in Arizona. What happens? They can build up to four new casinos. Are they going to build a casino somewhere else? And if the tribes are going to start building casinos, acquiring land, taking it into trust, and building new casinos, the question's going to start getting asked. If they can build a casino at 95th Avenue and Bell, why can't the horse tracks have one at 19th Avenue and Bell? Indeed, and that question most likely will be asked, especially if they keep winning in court, except for that Ninth Circuit appeal. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you again. Thanks it's for great joining to see you, too. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you very much. Developers of the Westward Ho in downtown Phoenix are partnering with ASU to provide medical help and other services for the Westward Ho's elderly residents. Here now to explain the partnership is Dr. Michael Schaefer, Professor of Social Work and Director of ASU's Center for Applied Behavioral Health Policy. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank you, us. It's a real uh, pleasure. Let's talk about this partnership. What's going on now as far as, it, it sounds like it's a good educational opportunity and a good opportunity for those folks to get some needed services. It's a win-win all the way around uh, with uh, Westward Hobie and just literally across the street from the ASU downtown campus. We recognized a need. 300 residents live in that home. Uh, we have plenty of students here who are in need of good training opportunities, social work students, nursing students, etc. So what kind of services will be offered? We are establishing a, a clinic that will be student staffed and faculty supervised involving students in our uh, social work department, recreational therapy, nutrition, and nursing. And we're creating what we would call an interprofessional clinic that will meet some of the unmet needs of the uh, tenants that live in that building. Interesting. Now, uh, ASU nursing students, aren't they already working over there? They are. Nursing has had a very small uh, but long-standing presence. Uh, they have undergraduate nursing students that are over there one or two days a week uh, for a few hours. We found in a study that uh, one of our doctoral students did a couple of years ago with about 50 of the residents, those tenants have surprisingly good access to health care. What they don't have good access to is a lot of social uh, engagement activities. We found the tenants there largely isolated, lonely, mm. uh, et cetera. A lot of what we would call social disorganization uh, issues that results in our police and fire department in 2012 making 600 
rollouts to that property. Oh my. That's decreased over time, but still there's a lot of uh, uh, social issues there to, uh, to help these tenants address. And we should mention who these tenants are. These are the, the Elderly Preference Affordable Housing Group. What, what does that actually mean? Um, the property owners uh, here have an agreement with the housing and urban development of the federal government. And so all of the tenants that live there are on a, a government subsidized, low income, what we'd call a Section 8 value. Voucher. Um, the type of voucher that these tenants have, though, do not provide sufficient funding for the property owners to provide a lot of on-site support services. These individuals are tenants of the property. They're not residents. Big difference there. Interesting. And ASU will be leasing areas, parts of the property, correct? Indeed. We're leasing 15,000 square feet on the ground floor, so there's no displacement of any tenants. It, this was largely vacant space uh, on the ground floor of the property. That space is currently in the process of being converted. We're going to do four things with that property. Uh, one, we're going to create this interprofessional clinic to provide training opportunities for our students. Uh, second, we will move the center that I direct, the Center for Applied Behavioral Health Policy, and a new center that we're establishing in the area of child welfare. Um, our students, staff, and faculty that work in those centers will be officed uh, in that space. Third, we turn what is called the Concho Room, which is this wonderful cocktail lounge that I don't know, I'm sure you've probably been in that space. I, I, I don't know if I've been in it, but I've heard about it. I've heard of a lot of things with the Westward Ho, yeah. underground things also, but go ahead, please. Yeah, so the Concho Room is being converted into a dedicated training and community engagement space. We do a lot of continuing education for probation officers, mental health counselors, addiction counselors, etc. And we always want to hold those training opportunities and community meetings on ASU property. We have such a precious little amount of space here, and of course our space here's needs have to go first and foremost to our student needs. Now, so, as, as far as the uh, timetable, uh, nursing students that you say are already over there, but, but I'm sure renovation needs to be done. Well, what are we looking at here? We're about 60% of the way in uh, the demolition work that's occurring. Uh, we've got a very tight construction timeline. Um, our goal is to get ourselves moved in and established uh, late July, uh, middle of August. What kind of response are you getting so far from the, the, the property manager, the owner, the residents? Uh, excuse me, the tenants. tenants yes. The tenants. You know, the response has been um, uh, overwhelming. I've enjoyed over the nine years that I've been cultivating this initiative to really establish a nice relationship with the owners who are ironically based in Rhode Island. The, owner, the ownership of that property is a company that's based out of Rhode Island. They've held the property since 1979. They've been a little bit nervous about uh, us ivory-towered academics and our uh, well-intentioned students coming in and creating chaos for their 300 uh, tenants. So that relationship continues to grow. Uh, uh, Jack Bentz, uh, one of the principal owners, and I, uh, we have a deep abiding relationship. Uh, the tenants, their biggest concern, as you may remember, Ted, when ASU was considering a move downtown, uh, there were some original discussion plans that that could potentially become our dormitory. Yes, indeed. That didn't happen. And so the tenant's biggest concern is, you guys are going to move us out. As we explained, no, we, have, we want you to stay in place because it provides a great opportunity. That's been wonderful. We've had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to go meet with the Roosevelt Action Alliance and the Downtown Voices Coalition, and the response from the community has been uh, just overwhelmingly supportive. Well, as you described it, it does seem like it's a win-win, especially for yeah. those folks that are over there and, and could use a little bit of uh, social engagement, not to mention medical assistance as well. But the Westward Ho, Oh, maybe the Eastward Ho, since it's owned by the Rhode Island Company, but the history of that place, it's phenomenal, isn't it? It is, it is, and that's one of the things that I've, uh, I've grown to appreciate. Built in 1928, it was the, originally the tallest building uh, west of the Mississippi, the first property to have air conditioning. It was the place to be in this property. Three presidents uh, stayed there. Al Capone stayed there. Uh, one of the great, two great trivia pieces that I've heard, one was the last time that President John Kennedy was checked into that hotel, uh, there was a certain individual checked in at the San Carlos with a monogram of MM. 
MM was. Oh, okay. All right. I'm searching for all sorts of all sorts of communists or all sorts of uh, mafia people, and I know who yeah, MM. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, well. Good luck on this, and I think I, if anyone's got a problem with this, I don't know what's going on there because it sounds, at least uh, on the surface and at least from what you've told, this sounds really like a nice thing to do and a good opportunity for students as well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. The U.S. Supreme Court hears a same-sex marriage case that could impact Arizona. And renovations at the State House of Representatives continue to raise eyebrows. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.